I'd like to get started and welcome to you to the last reading in this season's series of readings sponsored by the Friends of the Scranton Public Library with assistance from the Pennsylvania Council on the Arts. If you have not done so already, we have a sheet of paper that we would like you to put your name on and also please your address. Uh, the Arts Council likes us to keep a record of of who shows up at the readings and how many people and so on, but also we're trying to compile a mailing list for next year's series, which funding from the state willing should be started next October and you should be reading about it in Metro and so on. Tonight, Tess Gallagher is here with us. She currently is the coordinator of the creative writing program at Syracuse University and started there this year. And in recent years, she's taught at a variety of schools around the country, the University of Arizona, uh, St. Lawrence in New York State, Kirkland in New York State. Originally, she's from Washington State. And her poetry has appeared very widely. You might have seen some in the New Yorker American Poetry Review. She also has a column in the American Poetry Review. And two books published by Greyfriar, Grey Wolf Press, excuse me, Under Stars, Instructions to the Double, both of which will be for sale here at the end of the reading. And I think since we're underway a little bit late, I'd like to cut the introduction short and rather than say something about her poetry, let you listen to it. Tess Gallagher. I brought um, another book here that I want to mention to you, and I think I'll even start off with somebody else's poems, uh, just because I'm very excited about this book. I um, went with a very small press, Grey Wolf Press, when I first started to publish in 1976. Uh, small presses were just starting to feel their oats in those days, and uh, I couldn't get my book published by any of the big presses. It would come back. It was during the uh, feminist, uh, the beginning of the real rabid feminist uh, poetry, and my book, I guess, was too moderate or something. It was too quiet, and I would get nice notes back from Fran McCullough, Harper and Rose, saying, "Well, this is all this is all very nice, but, <laughs> but," <laughs> and so I finally got Grey Wolf Press to take a chance on doing their first book, and they did mine and it's now in its third edition, and that's um, Instructions to the Double, this book. And it took them um, two years to do the book the, in the original. They, they published it by hand. He and his girlfriend turned it out um, by hand. And so it was a kind of labor of love. Then I did the second book in 1978, and it's now in, in, in a second edition, and I've been asked these very presses that said no have now come back um, wanting, wanting me to publish with them. But I haven't gone for several reasons. One is that the press is in, uh, near, near where I was raised, about an hour from Port Angeles, Washington. It's in a place called Port Townsend, Washington. And um, another reason is I really like this man. I feel like he dedicated two years of his life at the start and took a chance on my work. and that. He's not just a little farm team, you know, and now I shouldn't go to the big leagues. I should stay with him and want to stay with him. And also, I can have a, a part in uh, choosing the manuscripts uh, that he now publishes. And one of the manuscripts that we've been working on um, and working with this woman, Linda Gregg, she has been writing for 17 years and is just now publishing her book. And this is it. It's called too bright to see. I, I've been telling her I think she's kind of the Noguchi of poetry right now because she's very, um, very simple, very clear, but the work has volume at the same time. She spent a lot of time in Greece. She doesn't do many readings, so I, I want to give her this little bit of help to introduce her to you and then read from my own poems. This is a poem called, There She Is. When I go into the garden, there she is. The specter holds up her arms to show that her hands are eaten off. She is silent because of the agony 
there is blood on her face. I can see she has done this to herself, so she would not feel the other pain. And it is true, she does not feel it. She does not even see me. It is not she anymore, but the pain itself that moves her. I look and think how to forget. How can I live while she stands there? And if I take her life, what will that make of me? I cannot touch her, make her conscious. It would hurt her too much. I hear the sound all through the air that was her eating, but it is on its own now, completely separate from her. I think I am supposed to look. I am not supposed to turn away. I am supposed to see each detail and all expression gone. My God, I think, if paradise is to be here, it will have to include her. I had um, met her um, at a vi when she visited my house and had heard this manuscript, uh, poems from it, read to me in my living room. And I had said to her, send me your poems when you get them all together. And so we went back into our separate lives, and I didn't hear anything from her for a while. And I picked up the Iowa Review and opened it to a poem of hers. And it was this poem, and it reminded me of her wanting to see this manuscript, so I wrote to her again, and that's how the, the book got started again, the idea for, for having a book. And this is a poem called Whole and Without Blessing, and I've been teaching a course there at Syracuse called Recent Women Poets, and we talked a lot about this poem, about uh, the feeling that uh, um, especially women have, I think, that they, their blessing needs to come from outside, and self-blessing is so difficult to come by. And this was a point at which she decided to give herself her wholeness, whole and without blessing. What is beautiful alters has undertow. Otherwise, I have no tactics to begin with. Femininity is a sickness. I open my eyes out of this fever and see the meaning of my life clearly, a thing like a hill. I proclaim myself whole and without blessing or need to be blessed. A fish of my own spirit, I belong to no one. I do not move, am not required to move. I lie naked on a sheet and the indifferent sun warms me. I was bred for slaughter like the other animals, to suffer exactly at the center where there are no clues except pleasure. So that's there for you to, to look at. Um, and you, if anyone wants one of those copies, I can spare one copy just brought two along with me. <coughs> this poem is called The Wives of My Childhood. And I, when I look at this poem, I, I think of, uh, of the fact that uh, uh, many of the, the mothers and wives uh, um, of the time when I was growing up, spent a lot of their time uh, with their families, doing things for the families. And this has become a somewhat defunct role. It's fallen into a kind of disrepute that at the same time bothers me and perplexes me uh, because I don't, I don't live that way. Uh, and yet, um, yet I realize the, the very, well, the very uh, benefits that come from that kind of, of giving and still feel, feel apologetic for having gone another route. So this is really addressed in a certain way to those people. It's called the wives of my childhood. I still come back to what they hoped for. Surely they were heroes, those women of sinks and supermarkets, of beautiful salads and 99 ways to use hamburger 
daring the man of the house to find their casserole wanting. I felt ashamed, leaving my starfoot track on their bright linoleum, for they have raised children who sing in the corridors, who send off their box tops for personalized miniature robots, who find their way up three flights of stairs to sell me Girl Scout cookies. I know these dwarf hands. They are my own. And the soldierly manner counting back might change like bounty. Little women, little pilgrims, tell your mothers I did not find the heavenly vineyards, though I drank from the vine. Tell them in the early days of my longing there were men, yes, and as men are, always the gift and hoard of an absent woman, mother, wife, or ghost. Say you found me alone and well, that I showed you where I sit to take the morning sun here by this window where the dark comes also. Say from my heart I make the soft wind and the keen Bounty where there is no sun, banners, brave leaves, brave shadow, brave in every labor, none to keep. I was visiting in the West recently, and um, I had, had been staying with a friend, and she was uh, had been very hospitable to me, and then I was leaving that morning, and on her way out for work, she said, today is my birthday. It was an awful trick, because I couldn't do anything about it, I thought. Uh, and she said, furthermore, it's my 39th birthday. <laughs> and uh, so I thought, well, I must get to a florist. So I walked, and sure enough, there uh, a florist appeared, florist, florist shop, and uh, flower shop. I went in, and this little exchange took place in there. So I, I wrote this little poem for her, just, just hard, hardly anything, but I'll just read it to you just because it's one of those poems which just really happens. Um, and uh, left the flowers for her at the florist's for Diane on her 39th birthday. It's going to be a nice day. Yes, but when the day is too nice, it's bad for the flowers. I'm still glad it's a nice day. Good luck, flowers. <laughs> Got involved doing a, a, a lot of horse poems and um, reading the whole history of horses. I have several books uh, about horses. I've been fascinated, as a lot of girls are thought at one point I was a girl disguised, a young girl disguised as a horse when I was growing up. And I read about the Arabs bringing horses into the household and how they, um, women cared for these horses. And then the men would take them out of the household after they got so big and race these horses. And I got to fantasizing really about these women taking care of these horses. And so this poem kind of grew out of that. And by the end of the poem, I was very surprised that these women got very, very old, kind of ancient, from dread in the eyes of horses. Eggs, dates, and camel's milk give this. In one hour, the foal will stand, in two will run. The care then of women the schooling from fear, clamor of household, a prospect of saddles. They kneel to it, folded on its four perfect legs, stroke the good back, the muscles bunched at the chest. Its head, how the will shines large in it as what may be used to overcome it. The women of the horses comb out their cruel histories of hair, only for the pleasure of horses, for the lost mares on the ridge of yellow horses, their white arms praying the hair down breasts ordinary as knees. The extent of their power, this intimation of sexual wealth, from dread in the eyes of horses are taken their songs. In the white forest, the last free horses eat branches and roots are hunted like deer 
and carry no one. A wedge of light where the doorway opens the room, in it a sickness of sleep. The arms of the women bear coarse white hair. In a bank of sunlight, a man whitewashes the house he owns. No shores, no worlds above it, and farther, shrill, obsidian, the high feasting of the horses. The next poem came just uh, pretty nearly recorded out of a dream. And it's called The Hug. Everybody needs a lot of these. The Hug. A woman is reading a poem on the street and another woman stops to listen. We stop too with our arms around each other. The poem is being read and listened to out here in the open. Behind us, no one is entering or leaving the houses. Suddenly, a hug comes over me, and I'm giving it to you like a variable star shooting light off to make itself comfortable, then subsiding. I finish, but keep on holding you. A man walks up to us, and we know he hasn't come out of nowhere, but if he could, he would have. He looks homeless because of how he needs. Can I have one of those, he asks you, and I feel you nod. I'm surprised, surprised you don't tell him how it is, that I'm yours, only yours, etc., exclusive as a nose to its face. Love, that's what we're talking about, love that nabs you with for me only and holds on. So I walk over to him and put my arms around him and try to hug him like I mean it. He's got an overcoat on so thick I can't feel him past it. I'm starting the hug and thinking, how big a hug is this supposed to be? How long shall I hold this hug? Already we could be eternal, his arms falling over my shoulders, my hands not meeting behind his back, he is so big. I put my head into his chest and snuggle in. I lean into him. I lean my blood and my wishes into him. He stands for it. This is his, and he's starting to give it back. So well, I know he's getting it. This hug, so truly, so tenderly, we stop having arms, and I don't know if my lover has walked away, or what, or if the woman is still reading the poem, or the houses. What about them? The houses. Clearly, a little permission is a dangerous thing. But when you hug someone, you want it to be a masterpiece of connection, the way the button on his coat will leave the imprint of a planet in my cheek when I walk away, when I try to find some place to go back to. Next poem is a more kind of mythic poem using some details from my childhood. <clears throat> the fact that I was raised with three brothers, raised up in the Northwest where we, uh, it's a big family, so we mainly kind of lived off the land. My father um, raised some cattle, but he always went elk hunting and had venison and um, salmon. So some of that gets in here. But there's a kind of mixture of the time frame in it as though it's um, primitive and modern at the same time. One thing I might, exp might just mention is the Jainists, who were the, uh, the religion uh, in India, I think it is, where they have to uh, sweep before they walk. Is that right? Is it in India? Good. <laughs> um, and uh, they do this so that they don't crush any living thing, any bug or animal. And they have to wait uh, for any fruit. They can't pick the fruit. So this gets into 
a kind of self-accusation maybe at the end. I think the poem altogether is really a plea to bring back some of our generosity, a feeling that this has gone out too easily. We've needed some things, and because we needed those things, we asked so fervently we forget to be kind also. In that time when it was not the fashion, when the daughters came for me with their hands webbed in each other's hair, when they saw, even to the last, how desire kept me ripe, they grew tender as the portraits of swans whose necks are threaded on the open pond. Their arms at my waist were strong, were yearning. We walked near the water's edge. I told them the one story I called my life as it began when I looked back in that far place. On the table in the land of hunters, I said, there was meat, and it was eaten. I was born there with brothers. They learned the ways of the fathers, could take animals unawares. Some with their bows left many days and came to the fire, miraculous, the white deer on their arrows, carrying them far into pardon. Others returned the same day and leaned their guns in the doorway. They were not deceived about death. The elk hung their golden heads in the dirt of the shed. A long suddenness had closed their eyes open. I was a child with other children. We crept up. Our house had been blessed. We touched the cold fur, the bald eyes. My teeth were sharp. I could see the shape of a leaf in the dark. In one bed we slept, and in the night we held each other without words or desire, my brothers now with wives. Nearest blood that they were, my changes drove them from me. My hair was a veil at my back to catch what looks would follow. A tall man came into my life. He liked to dance and be sung to. Bend to me, I said, but not too far. I like to reach up. In a time when it was not fashionable, I neglected every good chance to live for myself alone. What do you need, I said, what pleases you? Even to those unfaithful, at some ripe moment I could refuse them nothing. I sent letters absolving what hurt they might fear to have done me. I pledged, I said, you are remembered well. When they brought their new, their old loves to meet me, I embraced them, I let my picture be taken in their company. I learned, in short, to stand with them in the beloved past moments so that nothing might be lost. I would give you hope against all this if I could, but I cannot. I have drunk insects at night from the river, nor did I wait for the fruit to fall. I walked without thinking who lives in the ground too many steps. Not even my death will have me. I am old and unfinished. Keep watch for me. I will have children to give away. One place that uh, David, I ha didn't tell David that I taught was uh, down in El Paso. I really just taught uh, in the summer down there. But um, I lived down there for longer. I lived there for about six months. And um, had a, a nice backyard. I used to sit out there and read in the backyard on a chair. And it was all fenced in. You couldn't see anything, but you could hear a lot of things. So I got this, this poem, which has a lot of sound in it. It's as though the world were suddenly reduced to sound, and that's all you had. It was called View from an Empty Chair. I began, I began to imagine <laughs> the, just what the chair might, might be like there by itself, too. Late afternoon light between peach trees, where I take the view over the stone borders from a card table chair. No movement, just one child voice telling another, I'll show you, and heading into valor. Sound of furious peddling 
clash of spokes, a wash of sparrows breeze from a rooftop where periscopes of pipes and ducts cause the houses to submerge in the deep air. Behind me, the red muzzle of a hound snuffles the ledge. Mournfully, I occur to him, an intonation of wrongness in the landscape. I feel the danger I mean to someone unknown and near. Over the wall, a coffee mug appears, then upper torso of a woman. She lets the dog bound against her. He hates men, she tells me. He lunges his soft, loose mouth against the guard wire, proving loyalty by insistence on threat. She lives alone, has had tools stolen from the patio. Visitors and burglars chants the house dog, a terrier I hear as terror. The air is finely tuned. One glance away, and her head is gone. Country Western bleeds from a doorway, opened brightly. There goes my everything. Then shut, so birds come in again as underscoring to a car, luffing past. My house, with quiet skill, intends to pull over me with shadow. The child recurs, imitating death pains as comic and reversible. Gathering my sweater and water glass, I catch a child's drawing the wind has carried into the yard. It has a friendly aspect, the mouth like a hammock, though the hands are levers and the eyes demented and aslant. We brighten once before the house drops over us. This one is called Tableau Vivant. Um, as though the dead could speak. I think the ending of it um, seems to please people because we, um, we're so psychologized out these days that we sort of feel like we're supposed to forgive everything because we understand why the creep did it, you know. <laughs> and the poem kind of allows for a little instance of it being OK to, you know, just get out of that. They think it's easy to be dead, those who walk the pathway here in stylish shoes, portable radios strapped to their arms selling the world's perishables, even love songs. They think you just lie down into dreams you will never tell anyone. They don't know we still have plans again for romance and miss things like hats and casseroles. As for dreams, we take up where the living leave off. We like especially those in which the dreamer is about to fall over a cliff or from a bridge that is falling to. We're only too glad to look down on the river gorge enlarging under a body's sudden weight to have the ground rushing up instead of this slow caving in. We thrive on living out the last precious memories of someone escaped back into morning light. Occasionally, there's a message saying they want one of us back, someone out there feeling guilty about a word or deed that seems worse because we took it as living harm, then died with it quietly. But we know a lot about forgiveness, and we always make these trips with a certain missionary zeal. We get back into our old sad clothes. We stand again at the parting, full of wronged tenderness and needing a shave or a hairdo. We tell them things are okay, not to waste their lives in remorse. We never held it against them. So much happens that no one means. But sometimes one of us gets stubborn, thinks of evening the score. We leave them calling after us, sorry, 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 and we don't look back.
The next one comes from the Arizona days. Uh, I had a house there, my fr first time I ever owned a house. But before I could get there, you know, uh, Arizona, Tucson, Arizona is uh, like a boom town. Must be, I, I sort of have an idea of how Alaska must have been, because <laughs> uh, all the services are just incredible. You, can't, you, you can get a house built faster than you can get your phone installed, <laughs> things like that. Um, so before I could get there, my house had been vandalized. And everything, you know, all my books and things strewn all over the yard, and rug cut up, and walls damaged. And so the house really needed a lot of cheering up. So the best way I thought to do it was to start to paint it. And uh, so I hired a young man to come and paint the outside, and I, I did the inside, so I didn't like to climb up too high. And he um, would come just when the sun was just starting to get up, because it's very hot there. And if you don't get at it right away, you can fry out there on the roof. So as I woke up this one morning, I had this sensation of his brush against the house. <laughs> And I thought it had penetrated my dream. I thought that my dream and these brush strokes somehow overlapped. And it just, with that sensation, was really the beginning of the poem. The poem essentially became a poem about ownership, about how impossible it is to own anything. And I never realized this until I tried to own this house. And of course, it was a complete disaster. Um, but. Uh, by the end of the poem, I had this incredible kind of transformation as though not only did I give up the ownership of this house, but I felt my body kind of turning into a kind of light as though I too had somehow given up the ownership of myself. Uh, hard to explain uh, when you have a poem by which you write the poem and you disappear <laughs> at the end of it. <laughs> Called willingly. I didn't feel any remorse about this. When I get up, he has been long at work, his brush limber against the house. Seeing him on his ladder under the eaves, I look back on myself asleep in the dream I could not carry away. Sleep inside a house that is being painted, whole lifetimes now only the familiar cast of morning light over the prayer plant. This not remembering is something new of where you have been. What was settled or unsettled in sleep stays there, but your house under his steady arm is leaving itself, and you see this gradual surface of new light covering your sleep has the greater power. You think now you felt brush strokes or the space between them, a motion bearing down on you, an accumulation of stars, each night of them, arranging over the roofs of entire cities. His careful strokes whiten the web, the swirl of wood grain blotted out like a breath stopped at the heart. Nothing has changed, you say faithlessly, but something has cleansed you past recognition. When you stand near his ladder looking up, he does not acknowledge you. And as from daylight in a dream, you see your house has passed from you, into the blessed hands of others. This is ownership, you think, arriving in the heady afterlife of paint smell. A deep opening goes on in you. Some paint has dropped onto your shoulder as though light concealed an unsuspected weight. You think it has fallen through you. You think you have agreed to this. What has been done with your life willingly?